If everybody can take their seats, please, we are about ready to begin. My name is Ann Orsi. I'm the president of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers, and we're real excited about the program today. Um, it has been planned for about six months, and it's finally come together. Uh, so we're really excited. A couple of housekeeping uh, things. The bathrooms are out in this hallway. The men's is one direction and the ladies is the other, and I'm probably going to mix up which one's which, so just go look. <laughs> we have stickers for, if you parked in library parking, we have stickers that you can put on your parking ticket for a discount. Uh, it gives a 50% discount on your parking. Uh, and there is some swag that our speaker has brought, and Byrne is over there managing the table for us, and we appreciate the swag and the manning of the table. Uh, Brian Shank is one of our board members, and he is the person who is really responsible for our speaker being here today. I'm going to uh, let Brian introduce our speaker. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Brian. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the Salon of the Mind presentation. Salon of the Mind explores topics related to science, culture, uh, current events. And the topic of our presentation today is going to be election and reform. And more specifically, it's, it's an area that's usually referred to as social choice theory, which is a branch of economics, interestingly. We are very pleased to have this topic presented by Kirsten Elliott, a native of Sherwood, Arkansas, she is a nonprofit professional with experience raising funds for a variety of causes, including childhood literacy, raptor conservation, and voting reform. She currently serves as the Director of Philanthropy for the Center for Election Science, a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to studying and advancing better voting methods. Kirsten Elliott holds a Master of Public Policy from the University of Utah and Bachelor's of Arts degrees in Political Science and Mass Communication from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Today, she will be explaining the very flawed nature and dysfunction of most all of our elections and giving us advice on how to fix it, and thus the title of her talk, Fixing Our Broken Ballot Box. Now, personally, I really love the organization, the Center for Election Science, and what Kirsten and her colleagues are doing. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of what they're doing. And it's my opinion that what they're advocating is probably one of the most beneficial things and most empowering things you can do for the voter uh, of any change you could make to our elections. So with that, please give your full attention to Kirsten Elliott and welcome her to the podium, Kirsten Elliott. Hey all, it's nice to be here. Uh, thanks Brian for the warm welcome. Um, so, so yeah, so um, Ann mentioned, I've been planning this for about six months. Brian's one of our longtime supporters at the Center for Election Science and um, I was really excited when he invited me to come speak and then I was living in Salt Lake City at the time But I'm from here and then my boyfriend at the time proposed and decided he was going to the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville for law school So we had a wedding and a move to plan so we settled here about a month ago um, And so I am really appreciative to the Society of Freethinkers for having me and also for being really flexible with the timing um, So we're gonna talk about voting methods today and before I start does anybody know what a voting method is? Great. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, you're totally right on there. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to get you guys involved as much as I can when I'm talking. If you have questions, raise your hand. I'll answer them. Um, I don't want to lecture you. Okay. All right. So as Brian said, this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm a native Arkansan. I grew up in Sherwood. I graduated from Mills High School out in Little Rock, uh, also from UA Little Rock. Um, I am a pretty recent vegetarian, um, so I'm usually cooking in my kitchen trying to whip up something interesting. I'm a big bird nerd. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I worked in raptor conservation, so I worked with birds of prey. Um, I have two dogs. I have a lovely husband. really like to travel because I work for a remote organization. We don't have a headquarters anywhere. Um, and I really like whiskey. So if you want to hang out afterwards, these are the things I like to do. 
And these are just some pictures. So that's my husband, Mason, and our two dogs, and that's me holding a red-tailed hawk at the Goshoot Mountain Hawk Watch out in eastern Nevada in my last job. So before I get started, um, I want to know about you guys. So um, give me some inkling of who you all are and, and what your backgrounds are. So maybe like by a show of hands, like who are our diehard left-leaning people in the room? No shame. Awesome. What about our like polar opposite, our very to the right friends, including our libertarians? Anybody over there? Okay, perfect. And our centrists. Do we have any centrists? Okay, cool. I put myself in the centrist camp. Um, and so how do you feel about the current state of politics, whether it be local, state, or, or national right now? Abysmal. Abysmal, is that what you said? And I'd say she's an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> well, without using those words, um, okay, what about policies? Are there policies that you feel like people are ignoring? Um, tell me some policies. Gun control. Gun control? Climate change. Climate change, anybody else? Healthcare. Healthcare? Government corruption. Government corruption? Education. Education? Separation of, Separation of church and state. I came from Utah, guys. We're basically a theocracy out there. I feel you. Um, campaign finance. Campaign finance. Woo! Yeah, we're getting into all sorts of nitty gritty stuff. Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights. Okay, these are all really interesting topic areas. Um, show of hands, do you feel like we're making progress on these issues? Yes? No? You can show your hand for that one too? Okay, cool. So you may have noticed in the description of this talk that I picked a few things that I thought were um, compelling. And so I've got some representative images here. So um, healthcare, climate change, and immigration are three issues that if you look at the Pew Research, the majority of Americans agree upon these issues, that there are real problems and we need to be doing something. Um, so about 62% of Americans um, agree that immigrants are uh, adding to our country rather than burdening it. Um, about that many people think that climate change is real and we're not doing enough to uh, solve climate change or at least reduce its impact. And even more Americans agree that healthcare costs are skyrocketing out of control and we need to do something to fix it. This is my image of everyone who's doing things to fix it. <laughs> And I get that's a bit overblown. Um, I know there are local politicians here and national politicians that really are trying to work on these issues, but we're not getting anywhere. And that's really causing some problems for us as voters. Um, so 17% of Americans approve of the job Congress is doing. I want to do a show of hands and just see how many people in this room think Congress is doing a good job. Great. That's what I thought. You're all here, right? 91% of, of Americans think our country is politically divided. And 61% of Americans don't feel represented by either the Democratic or the Republican Party. Um, and so you guys throw out a lot of issues that could be impacting this, right? Um, and some that I hear quite often, one that was mentioned earlier is campaign finance. Certainly that plays a role here. Um, gerrymandering, we were talking about that as I was coming in. Gerrymandering plays a role. Brian and I were talking about it a little bit. Uh, but there's something that we at the Center for Election Science would argue is a little bit closer to the issue and perhaps even more solvable um, in a really nice nonpartisan if sometimes boring fashion. Voting method reform. So um, we would argue that how we got here into this really politically divided, nasty place where we have two parties with all this power is because of the way we vote. And in civics classes, you may have heard of this as first past the post, or perhaps plurality. At the Center for Election Science, we've coined the term choose one voting, and we like to do that because that's what you're doing, and it's free of jargon. Um, and so you can see on our little sample ballot here of American presidents that our fictional voter has chosen the one candidate they're allowed to choose, and they have chosen George Washington. And that's the way we all learn to vote, right? But it's not the only way we can vote. And it turns out that there's some real problems that occur here when we vote this way. So one of the first ones is that with choose one voting, it forces you to vote strategically rather than honestly. So show of hands, how many times have you walked into a ballot box and you've voted for the lesser of two evils but not your favorite candidate? That is alarming. Um, so this is an illustration by one, another one of our supporters, Andy Schuler, just trying to explain that. But So when we're only allowed to vote for one person, we're not just considering our favorite candidate or the policies they're running on. We're looking at political viability, too. So if we're looking at the 2016 presidential election, for example, who did you want to vote for? Anybody? Who did you want to? You were, like, excited and you wanted to vote for that person. Bernie. Bernie, Bernie wasn't even on the ballot. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody? Hillary. Okay, cool. So Hillary was there, so that's great.
great. Maybe you were a Stein supporter. Do we have any Gary Johnson supporters? Gary Johnson? Okay, cool. But we often hear that that's throwing away our vote or that we're not going to have an impact on the election. And that's us considering that political viability. Another problem that occurs when we have choose one voting is we have a lot of this mudslinging, right? So when you have to choose one candidate, it's really easy for it to become an us versus them conversation. And for if I want to campaign against Brian, let's say, I can say, don't vote for Brian. Brian is a crazy libertarian, and he's going to ruin our world. Have I talked about any policy issues? Do you know what I care about? Do you know how I'm going to fix your country? Doesn't matter. But if that's what sways voters, I'm going to get elected. So politicians are pitted directly against each other rather than looking at the issues and talking about solutions. Another issue we see, and the one that I would argue is probably the most alarming, is that we see candidates that are winning without broad support. And this chart is really small, and we'll look at it in depth in a minute. It's an example from Fargo, North Dakota. Um, but so you see that there are many candidates in an election, and they're splitting the vote along common ideologies. Um, so I wanted to take a minute and ask, so have you all in any of your local state elections seen candidates win with like far less than 50% of the vote? We have runoff elections, so if someone doesn't get 50%, then it automatically goes to runoff. Okay, and that's... That's, that's only true for the primary, or for uh, local, state, for local elections. Yeah, sure. Partisan elections, you could win with, I guess, 38% of the votes. So we've got runoffs, so you could have a runoff. Um, that's more expense to you, the taxpayer. Um, it's also kind of artificially figuring out who that winner would have been. We've just thrown out the rest of the candidates that were running, and now we're trying to fi find a majority falsely. Um, so this is another issue that can happen, and you can see that in this chart, and we'll go through that a little bit more. Um, but certainly the point here is that should someone be governing you that's only gotten 22% of the vote? Seems a little concerning. And then there's this other idea that our choose one voting method just reinforces this duopoly of Republican versus Democrat, conservative versus liberal. And there's no real room for new ideas or new candidates to flourish. And so when we're talking about that, have you ever gone to vote for a third party candidate or an independent candidate or even said that you were interested in it and someone said, you're throwing away your vote, stop it. Or you're going to elect Hillary, stop it. Or Trump, right? We've all been there. And so this is another issue that occurs here. So I mentioned earlier that this is not the only way we can vote. We're taught this way in school that this is how we vote. You go and you select one person. Um, but it turns out that there are a lot of really nerdy people out there that have been looking at different ways of voting for years. And um, we could spend like weeks in here talking about all of them and their pros and cons. Uh, but thankfully, that's something that my organization already did. And so um, we have a preferred method, and it's called approval voting. And so before I get started and talk about approval voting, I want to give some, some backstory here because I think it's important, um, especially speaking to a group of people who are agnostic or atheists and are approaching things from a really rational viewpoint, trying to look at the best solutions, is we were founded in 2011 by, like I said, a bunch of economists, game theorists, political scientists, mathematicians, and other self-proclaimed nerds. Um, and they were really looking at this problem and saying, I don't like what's happening. I don't think our voting method works. What do we do? we need to pick another method. Well, which one do they pick? Like I said, there are dozens of these and dozens of people who are supporting them. And this method called approval voting really sang out to them as being the easiest to implement at the lowest cost with the best advantages. And so they did the studies. Um, approval voting's been studied since the 1970s by researchers like Stephen Brams. Um, and it's widely regarded by political scientists and mathematicians and game theorists as being really the most solid voting method there is. But nothing's really happened. So this is what approval voting looks like. Again, our fictional voter has walked into the ballot box and they are being asked to select the winner. And they have now selected George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt. Person with the most votes wins. You can vote for as many as you like. Okay, I see some people who are looking at this with differing faces right now. So I wanna pause and say, what say you? What do you think of this? Yeah? One problem I see is that it seems like a very small segment of the, of the populace may be the ones that swing it and make the difference. Everybody, let's say, yeah, everybody likes Washington, everybody likes Lincoln, and, you know, everybody, but a few like Teddy, and, you know, they may or may not also vote for Harrison and Hoover, but 
But you know, if, if George Washington gets 95% of the votes and Abraham Lincoln gets 94%, it's basically just 1% of the population who decided that Washington was like the, the office. So what I would argue for you there is that um, we're still seeing a really broad base of support, right? And so this is one of the common complaints about approval voting, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about these, because we talk about them really widely on our website, and we think it's important to be transparent about its weaknesses. And so one of the weaknesses certainly is that you um, may not get your favorite every time. Um, I have a volunteer who likes to talk about if you were going to a barbecue and you were deciding to take a pie. Think about your favorite pie. What would you take? But you know what everybody loves? Apple pie. So like you're pretty safe if you choose apple pie. So certainly George Washington might not have been everyone's, might have won out the election, right? Because he was the most palatable to everyone, even if he wasn't the most favorite candidate. Does that make sense? Okay. Let it sink in. I know, it's different, it's weird. I thought that too. Okay, so approval voting. So like I said, it's a really simple change, but it has a lot of impact, and there's some reasons that we like it. And so the first reason is that you can always support the candidate that you like the most without being forced to think about that political viability situation. So if you vote for, let's say in the 2016 election, if you could have voted for Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, you're not going to cause vote splitting, right? There's no way that you can cause vote splitting. You're able to vote for both. You don't have to choose one or the other. So that's a really nice feature of it. Another thing we like is it allows you to fully express your opinions on the ballot box. So um, I like the ice cream example because who doesn't like to pick lots of flavors of ice cream when they go into the shop? Like if you get three scoops, do you want to just get vanilla or do you want to get like vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry? Um, so you can support the candidates that, ex that express opinions along a variety of issues. And so I think the Green Party is a really good example here. The Green Party is known for its strong environmental issues, but often people feel like it's lacking in covering other policy issues perhaps. You can vote for the Green Party and say, this is an issue area that I really care about, but I'm also going to vote for a Democrat because they cover the bases in other policy areas that the Green Party might not be addressing. And as we're allowing more of these ideas to get out there, we don't have to worry that if we vote for a third party or an independent candidate that they're going to spoil the election for a mainstream candidate or they're going to cause vote splitting. We also see that candidates are more encouraged to run, which means you as the voter get more choice when you walk into the ballot box. You're not just getting the most palatable person that the Republican Party or the Democratic Party chose to put on the ballot. You're getting the people that are excited about running because you keep showing your support for them. And that means that we're gonna see candidates that are showing more representative views of the electorate. And as we talked about earlier, this back and forth causes us to talk a lot more about mudslinging and about personal characteristics instead of real solutions. So with approval voting, candidates have to win your vote. And when they have to win your vote, they have to talk more about those policy solutions. Does any government actually use approval voting now? That's a really good question. Yes, they do. So, um, so Fargo is, is our uh, case study here. Um, so I guess I should give a bit of a, a backstory here. So Greece, many, many years ago, used approval voting. Um, but prior to, uh, prior to Fargo, North Dakota looking into this, there were no cities in the US states that were using this voting method. Um, we frequently heard from people, we don't want to be your guinea pig, stop it. Um, but so Fargo, North Dakota, of all places, it's not just a place where the Coen brothers filmed a cool movie with a wood chipper, um, they were having some real issues with their elections. Um, specifically, people were winning city commissioner seats with far less than 25% of the vote. So you had people governing your city who really weren't that popular. And they knew that change was needed. And so they started looking for potential solutions. So this is that graph that we looked at earlier, um, and this is their real election results from 2015. You see that Tony Gehrig was elected as city commissioner with 22% of the vote, despite the fact that we have four other candidates that came within 10 percentage points of Tony. Had approval voting been enabled in this scenario, there's some overlap between these candidates, and you have to get into local politics to understand where they would overlap, but you would have seen candidate percentages rising here, and you would have seen someone with a more broad base of support winning. So, what do they do? 
So the city commission said, what do we do here? We need to figure something out. Let's create an elections task force. And one of the people on our task force is pictured here. His name's Jed Lemke. And uh, Jed really becomes the hero of this story. Um, Jed is not a political organizer, he is not a fundraiser, he is not a nonprofit professional, nor is he a mathematician, but he is a voting methods nerd. Um, and he had looked into some of the research and he reached out to us for help at the Center for Election Science. And um, being the scientific organization that we are and the fact that we don't want to push things on communities, we said, well, let's look at your election results. Let's see what's happening here and, and let's see what you need. We like approval voting, but it may not fit your circumstances. Well, it did, it turns out, after looking at the election results. And so Jed took that research back to the task force and they recommended approval voting to the city. As with many things in politics, nothing happened. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? Um, why would an elected official who's winning with 22% of the vote want to fight harder for your support when they can get elected on such a small margin? But Jed, again, I mentioned is the hero, and with all good heroes, he uh, wouldn't give up. And he built what we affectionately called an approval voting army. Um, and that was just a team of other passionate Fargoans who were really upset that their elections weren't working for them, that Jed and the task force had looked for uh, unbiased opinions on what to do here, and that the city had ignored it. And so they decided to put it up on the ballot. This is just a collection of photos of some of our supporters, including our, our youngest one down there. I think she's like eight. She's the daughter of one of the, the volunteers, and she canvassed just as hard as anybody else in the North Dakota uh, fall and winter. Um, and so what we found when we were in Fargo was that much like many of the people in this room that I'm speaking to right now, nobody had heard of voting methods, and nobody knew that there were any other solutions, and they certainly hadn't heard of approval voting. Um, but once we started explaining it and they were able to ask some questions and understand what it would do for their community, that we would start seeing people that were elected with a greater percentage of the vote, that we would have less of these negative campaign tactics, and that we would be able to get people talking about real policy solutions, people were really excited. And they won. 63.5% of voters voted in favor of issue one last November in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I realize that it's 120,000 people that are so far away from Little Rock, Arkansas that it really doesn't seem relevant in some cases. Um, but I share it because, number one, to Anne's point, this is the only city in the country that's adopted approval voting. But also because our organization had been around since 2011, and we were really trying to talk about this. Um, Brian and I had lunch before we came here, and Brian said, I just keep trying to talk to people about approval voting, but they just, it's not interesting, you know? And I understand that. There are a lot of big issues, whether you care about immigration and the kids that are on the border that are being detained, whether you care about rising sea levels, whether you care about tax reform. It's really hard to care about something like this, but it's quite tied to all of those issues because who we elect makes those decisions. And what we found when we talked to people was that they really did support it once they heard about it. So here I am today talking to all of you, and we're a little bit closer this time now than Fargo, North Dakota. So um, we really had not slept off the election woes before we got a call from some people in St. Louis, Missouri, who said, our elections are not going very well. Um, in just the last eight years in St. Louis City's elections, they have seen five elections where the winner was selected with less than 39% of the vote. Um, it is a lot of vote splitting that's happening, primarily in the Democratic Party, oftentimes along racial lines. It's really not helping that community make better decisions for themselves. And they had been looking at voting method reform. They were looking at ranked choice voting. Some of you may have heard of that. Maine has adopted it. It's another um, way to get around this choose one voting method. But it was going to cost the city about $3 million to be able to, uh, to implement that. And so they said, well, approval looks like a, like a good option as well. So we at the Center for Election Science are helping them. Um, and we, again, we look at what communities need. And so in St. Louis, we're working on this approval voting idea, but instead of it just being straight approval voting, it's with a nonpartisan open primary with the top two finishers going to the general election. It's what fit their community based on their needs, and it's also what fit their community based on their local laws. And that's a distinction that I really like to make at this point when I talk to people, because um, we were incorporated in Redding, California. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas. My boss lives in Chicago. I have colleagues in DC and in Denver. Um, I know that it can be really easy to feel like we're coming in and we're telling people what to do, and it couldn't be more the opposite. We like to have people approach us and say, 
we know what's happening in our local elections and we need help. Can you help us look at it and offer a solution? And that's what we did in St. Louis. Our goal is to keep building a base of cities and then move up to the state level within a few years. Um, hopefully within like five or six years we can get there. But for some perspective, when city councils and when state legislatures choose to ignore this discussion and they just squash it, <laughs> bills don't get out of committee, nobody listens to the recommendations, uh, we have to go the ballot initiative route and the cost for that is about a dollar per person. So in St. Louis, that's a population of over $300,000. So just on the education side of things, not on the advocacy, not on telling people to vote yes, we're looking at about $300,000 just in getting people to come to talks like this, answer their questions, go knock on doors, set up at tables and talk to them about different ways of voting. So how can you get involved if you are interested now? Um, so, like I said, one of the big challenges we face is that approval voting uh, hasn't really been heard about. Voting methods haven't been heard about. And so the one thing that I would encourage you to do after today is just give it a little bit more of a read. Um, we are, like I said, nonpartisan nonprofit. We also are a scientific organization. We do polling. We do research. We will study the Fargo election to make sure it achieves the outcomes we thought it would. Um, they'll be using it in 2020 in their first elections with that. Um, look at it. See if it makes sense to you. If it does, Share it with a friend, um, because it could maybe solve local elections in Maumelle, or Little Rock, or Sherwood, or Cabot, or wherever you live, or even the whole state of Arkansas. Um, we also have plenty of volunteer opportunities if you're interested in getting involved a little bit more there. There's obviously cost to these campaigns, and I'd be remiss as director of philanthropy not to mention that. And uh, the newest thing that we're trying to work on is um, we're trying to start local chapters. And I, I wanted to end with that because I know that Brian really believes that this is something that, um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, when you look at the data, when you look at the science that's there and that it's been studied for years and years and years, you see that this is really a way to get some progress moving in our country. And I know he's really passionate about it, and he'd love to get some momentum going here. Um, so, with that said, anybody have questions? Sure, Chris, what's up? Have you done any research, or has anyone done any research on what people's default behavior is when they encounter someone on an approval ballot that they know nothing about? Do they give them the benefit of the doubt, or do they say, I don't know about the person, so I can't approve them? So I don't know that we've dug into that, but what we have looked at is we look at like the number of approvals that people will do on, depending on the size of the ballot. And what you find is that um, there's still a really large chunk of the population, I would say anywhere from like 40 to 60 percent, that is only going to choose one person. Because they still, that's the person that they want, and they're rightfully allowed to. Um, we do see that as candidate lists get longer, that people put more approvals on the ballot. So I wouldn't say that it's causing people to give people the benefit of the doubt. People are still pretty picky about who they want to cast their vote for. How about rank order in candidates? Rank choice, yeah. So, so rank choice is another method. It's called instant runoff voting in some communities, um, or rank choice or rank ordering, whatever you want to call it. And essentially, instead of having that nice approval voting ballot that we looked at where you just vote for all the candidates you like, you would put them in order. Um, it's another reform that's being pushed. Um, like I said, in St. Louis, they weren't able to do it without a $3 million upgrade in their voting machines. That's something that we've heard. It's also been a tactic that local and state governments have used to uh, stop this kind of reform, um, historically, uh, we saw that in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They adopted it by ballot initiative, and then Santa Fe just kept it out for years. I think they might have just recently gotten voting machines that will support ranked choice voting. Um, there are also some other issues that can happen more technically, though, um, one of which, and this is the part where I'll take a step back and say that my degree is not in mathematics, um, is that in some cases, when you rank your favorite first, you can actually cause them more harm than if you had put them second. And it's just the way that the, the ballots are moved around in ranked choice voting. Because what you're doing is once, that, once your favorite is eliminated because they didn't get enough votes, then they're shifting your ballot to your second favorite. Um, it's called the monotonicity criterion. If anyone wants to look up more about it, it's on our website. Um, and I find that it's a difficult concept to explain. But um, essentially that can happen. There's another issue that can occur with ranked choice voting where we have exhausted ballots, uh, which is basically you have ranked all the candidates that you like, and then there's no one else to rank, and so your ballot is spent, 
and your vote essentially doesn't count anymore. It's the same as if you hadn't showed up to the election. So for those reasons and the added complexity, we find that approval is, um, is a bit better. Um, I do find that sometimes people want more nuance, um, and that's perfectly fine. And there are some other more nuanced methods that just require more advanced voting machines, more advanced math, and more money to run campaigns. And so that's, that's a little less interesting. What's your name? That's a good question. We get that a lot. Um, so it could or it couldn't is the answer. Um, it really depends on what voters want and how it works. So in Fargo, it's being used in their general election um, for their city council. And so it's there's not like a partisan nature to that to begin with. Um, in St. Louis, we're looking at this for their partisan primaries um, because of state laws and also because of the unique situation they're facing. Um, so it certainly could. You could use it in a primary. You could use it in a primary and also use it in the general. Or you could use it in any arrangement of those choices. So therefore, you could actually not have a primary at all and the candidates of the past ones qualifying process petitions. Yeah, you could. Yes. So in St. Louis, that's the way it'll work if it's implemented, is it'll be a nonpartisan uh, open primary with the top two finishers going to the general election. Yeah. I, I don't like to comment. I don't like to suggest the possibility that if we didn't force voters to pick one candidate on a ballot, primaries may never come into existence in the first place. So that vote splitting problem is kind of what, what made primaries necessary in a kind of indirect fashion. Maybe hard to explain that, but that's my belief. So eventually, I would like to see personal primaries abolished entirely. in committee 
was part of what happened there. Um, have to consult a history book on approval voting there. Um, but I think you raise a really valid concern there, right? Which is that there is not an incentive, you're right, for people in power to make their elections more competitive. And so we often do have to go the ballot initiative route. Um, but I think there's a lot that you can do as a voter to try to uh, inhibit that. And so I think you know if you're interested in this, and like especially locally, and you wanted to work with Brian, um, so we have a whole election advocacy uh, toolkit on our website. It has language if you want to implement approval voting in uh, your, your local organization. So if Society of Freethinkers wanted to elect their board members this way, can totally help you out. Um, with your city council or at the state legislature level, we have that language available. We also have a letter to the editor template that you can write. We've seen a lot of success there with that starting to build some momentum. Um, and then just contact your local legislators. Uh, I know Brian worked really, really hard to get some local legislators to come today. Um, I am a little out of the loop on Arkansas politics, but I don't recognize anybody in here as a legislator, but maybe I missed that. And if I did, my sincere apologies. Um, so. I think there is a lot that we can do here to try to work on that, but it is a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, I am proud to say that in North Dakota we did have support from um, the Libertarians, from the Democratic Socialists, from the Democrats, from the Republicans. As a nonpartisan nonprofit, we're not really interested in going into a community and just working with one party because you end up with a situation like Maine where um, it did get labeled this left-leaning scam when it really wasn't. So what are the barriers with, you know, the, the state and federal constitution and laws? Like, do they just generally say there shall be a vote, or do they go into really specifics about the definition of an election and how it has to be? Like, it, is it spelled out anywhere that it has to be, you know, single-choice voting? It's pretty specific, and it varies wildly. Um, so in St. Louis, the reason that we're doing a, a nonpartisan uh, open primary with a top two finisher is because in, Saint, in Missouri, the law, the state constitution reads such that you can only vote for as many people in the general election as there are seats to fill. So if there's only one seat to fill, you get one vote, which means instant runoff voting, approval voting, score, star, any of the methods that you would look at, anything other than this choose one method would be illegal. Um, Texas has its own set of rules, um, and Texas's constitution actually makes it completely impossible for us to work there currently. And so for us to do that, we'll be looking at a change of the state constitution, which is a really big endeavor for an organization that has only had funding for about a year and a half. Um, so. Won't be in Texas anytime soon, unfortunately. I um, did not consult Arkansas state laws before coming here. I probably should have. Um, we do have an attorney in Los Angeles who's working on compiling a complete list of that for us. Kristen, thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much, Kristen, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks again to everybody who came. Um, I'm sure that Kirsten's going to be here if you have other questions or want to talk with her one-on-one -on -one and, and dialogue about any of this. And, of course, Brian's here, and he's up on this subject, too. Um, once again, we have stickers for your parking ticket. If you, uh, if you parked in the library parking, we can get you 50% off with, with one of these stickers. And other than that, thank you for coming. We stand adjourned. Thank you.